This afternoon I'm going to talk about three things, really. Um, first, what Hussam refers to in his various uh, missives to the speakers over the last few weeks. He refers to this as public and private interests in master planning. I don't know if I totally understand that, but I've got some points and I hope they're uh, hitting what he had in mind. Second, some comments about how to achieve more effective master planning, at least as far as I'm concerned. These are very personal views. Um, third, and finally, I want to look very briefly at a case study of master planning and development delivery, uh, where the city doesn't own any land and it has very little resource, but has managed to make big things happen. And I think there's some good lessons there for British master planners, deliverers, all of us in the city development business. However, right at the outset, um, I should say I am not an architect, I'm not a planner, I'm not an urban designer, I'm not an engineer by background, um, I'm an economist. However, I have acted as both client over a 20, 25 year period and as practitioner uh, in master planning, uh, being part of a consultant groups that have bid for work throughout the UK and abroad. So. Um, I have experienced it from both ends, if you like, as a practitioner and as a client. Indeed, right at the moment, Kevin Murray and I, hello Kevin, um, are working on a, a master planning uh, project in the west central Glasgow. Actually, they don't call it a master plan. What they call it is a development and economic framework. A bit of fluffy language there. We're never quite sure whether we're doing development and economic frameworks or master plans or or whatever. However, more to come on that one. Um, my frustrations with the master plan as a technical and a cultural phenomenon probably have two roots. I talked there first of all about a lack of clarity and I think probably I mean a, a lack of honesty. Uh, the client expectation that master plans are a good response to economic and social problems. In other words, by commissioning a master plan, you're going to be able to do something about employment in the area, jobs in the area, unemployment in the area, levels of poverty in the area, good quality, well-paid jobs, etc., etc. Um, now, in my view, as an economist, if you like, uh, is that in order to tackle those, you have to tackle them directly, not indirectly through a master plan. But it, it caused a few problems for me, and, 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 and this by way of, a, of an anecdote. I was part of a master planning team about 10 years ago, bidding for a piece of work in a northern uh, industrial town. And uh, here we were, architect-led planners, and, and I think they'd very kindly asked me to be part of the team as well, meeting counterparts uh, from the local authority on the other side of the table. And we were having a good old uh, discussion about what's in, what the priorities are, and so on. And at some stage, I said to the chair, who was a, uh, the councillor, what's the most important thing you want out of this uh, exercise, this master planning exercise? And he said, jobs, no doubt about it. No dubiety, jobs we want out of it. This place is on the, you know, it's on its uppers. We need jobs coming out of this. Now, what I should have done and the rest of the team, we should have all stood up and said, um, oh, I'm sorry, you've got the, 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 the wrong skill set here. We've got planners, architects, urban designers. I mean, they aren't going to do anything about jobs. Um, but there was a conspiracy of silence. We didn't get up and leave and say, oh, you better ask somebody else because we can't do this. Um, and neither did the professionals on the other side of the table. So I think honesty is the most uh, significant word there rather than lack of clarity. Second, uh, I've always felt that um, master planning, in fact, uh, needs a reality check. Um, as I say in the slide, we need to anchor the master plan in some notion of economic reality. Otherwise, it's an exercise in physical determinism, creating wish lists. Um, and often I've, uh, I've sat in master planning situations, and that's what it appears to have been a, a set of wish lists. Do we know that, that these are viable uses in this location, that this can happen? 
Do the cost implications make this plan totally undeliverable and pie in the sky? Um, there don't seem to be any constraints placed upon participants in the master planning process. So there's a couple of frustrations, um, or initial frustrations, about honesty and reality. It needs to be anchored in some notion of what's real. Now, I find it easier to talk about uh, making master plans more effective if perhaps we can distinguish between one or two types of uh, master plan here. This is basically just based on spatial level, what I call a macro, regional, subnational layer. Um, interestingly enough, uh, when I was compiling this list, I thought, well, I wonder if there is a regional uh, master plan for Scotland. We seem to have stopped doing regional master plans these days. Once upon a time, I, I think maybe we did. Uh, and certainly they're still popular in the continent of Europe, but they don't happen in Britain. And, and, and so far as I know, we have a decent, robust kind of economic strategy for Scotland, but no um, uh, regional uh, master plan. So this is, a, this is an endangered species, I think, uh, as far as Britain is concerned. Meso, we see that all around in terms of towns and cities and districts and so on. And micro uh, at the, at the neighborhood level. And the, at the site level, this is a more a traditional master plan. Uh, it's about fitting physical components on a specific site. So I, I, I will talk about these at different times. So first off, then, a couple of observations about the public and private interests in master planning. My take on all this uh, is very simply that regions, cities, towns, districts, and neighborhoods are all public goods. They're not pure public goods, but they are most emphatically public goods. There are little spots of private ownership there in terms of housing, in terms of offices, in terms of workshops and factories and so on. But on the whole, by and large, these chunks of territory are public goods, although not pure public goods. And therefore, public goods will require the public sector to play the role as a prime mover, taking the lead uh, in order to, to make statements about the future of these chunks of territory, if you like. Prime mover is a term that uh, Stephen Tolson and I used in the uh, architecture and design article that we wrote. Uh, we thought that kind of uh, summarize the notion of public sector being a participant in this rather than leaving it all to uh, the private sector. So for me it is a bit of a no-brainer um, that because these are public goods we're talking about it will inevitably mean that public sector must take the lead and must drive it forward. Secondly since because in my, in my, to my mind, good master plans should be setting quality standards for places. That's an important aspect of master planning. Whether they be neighborhoods or cities, wide or whatever, then it follows that master planning will require a public sector lead because of the fundamental mismatch between the goals, objectives, and aspirations of the public and private sectors. Um, they are different. They will have different goals and objectives and aspirations. And therefore, uh, one will need to be a prime mover, the other will need to be a follower. For example, the public sector should be striving to achieve, within reasonable tolerances, places which are attractive, sustainable, located where people actually want to live, and within a coherent labor market, not stuck out on the urban periphery, nowhere near any jobs or whatever. Whereas the private developer, is striving to put together a development which will yield a good return, There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, yield a good return, a quick in, a quick out, uncomplicated, hassle-free process. Therefore, the standard, develop, the standard developer model, left to its own devices, is unlikely to deliver the quality uh, that, that the public sector will be seeking because of this fundamental mismatch and if you don't believe me, how about this from the chief executive uh, of the British Property Federation, uh, 
Now, this is not a card-carrying member of the Unite Union, uh, nor is it a Guardian-reading lefty um, uh, comments or observations. What Liz Peace of the British Property Federation is saying is one of the short shortcomings of the predominant build-for-sale housing model is that the developer does not return long-term interest in the site. There is no incentive to produce a design better than the minimum needed to make a sale. And issues such as the design of the public realm and long-term maintenance can be sidelined without any impact on profit. Nice one, Liz, I think. She's saying there that the current model only produces that which can most easily be sold now, rather than that which will create an enduring community, a sense of place, an attractive, livable environment. Now, just as an aside, it is interesting to note that the government targets for housing are always given in quantitative terms. One party will say, this year we have built 25,000 houses, last year the other party only built 18,000. Targets are always given in quantitative terms. Government doesn't set standards in terms of quality at all. Um, and perhaps if it started to do so, this might affect the behavior of both public and private sectors towards this qualitative dimension, which I think is, is, is missing. And it would start to emphasizing, emphasize the importance of product quality. I, I personally think we should probably start to think about producing a quality statement and targets for housing in Scotland. It should be possible to do it. Um, and it would be a first. Uh, increasingly, public outputs are graded qu qualitatively, like hospitals and school. Why not housing? Why do we not know that maybe we did build 25,000 houses last year, but 18,000 of them were rubbish? So I think we need to know that. That's a dimension of public policy. But we don't know. It's just numbers. Um, and I think we, we, we should give some thought to that. After all, uh, as some economists would say, you only actually get what you measure. And if we can't measure quality, then we're not going to get it. So if the whole qualitative debate will require us to be able to measure it in, in, in some way. So what about making master planning more effective? Well, my first proposal is that we should produce economic master plans rather than just master plans. Uh, and that would help make them more effective, I think. Uh, I coined the term economic master plan to, com to combat the situation I mentioned in that northern town when we all should have stood up and said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you've got the wrong skill set here. Um, you need another set of blokes who are going to, or, or women for that matter, uh, who can come and help you solve the question. We're just physical guys. Um, what I think the economic master plan does, as it says there, is dead simple. Most of my ideas are dead simple. Um, it's an economic pl master plan which begins with an economic strategy and also includes a physical spatial framework as well and tries to integrate them. It's not a separate let's hand it over. It will try and integrate. At, the, at, the, at its best, it will try and bring together in a single document the two development components that are usually kept apart. It seeks to integrate. It's a genuine synthesis, if you like. The economic master plan should have the aspiration to build great places around the long-term needs and the ambitions of the economy to anchor future economic activity in a meaningful and realistic way. Uh, my own personal view is the economic master plan should try and make visionary spatial planning one of the hallmarks um, of the future place or as I like to say, the spatial framework should aim to set the economic strategy to music. Now, why the economic master plan is such a powerful, or potentially really powerful tool, is because it answers, or seeks to answer, the two most important questions which will affect all places. How will this place earn its living over the next 10 or 20 years? And what will that, or could it look like on the ground? And those are the two key, there are other questions, but those are the two key ones. And you can say that about any place, whether it's a region, a city, a neighborhood, 
place or whatever. I think some people tend to think that some of these considerations about the economic input only really have to do with macro and meso in my typology and not so much about neighborhoods. But think on this. Um, it's estimated that 40% of all jobs in the UK uh, in 10 years' time will be either self-employed or working in micro units, micro business units, which is statistically less than five people. 40%, that's big, that's a big shift. And, and we can already see that, that's on its way. Um, so rather than always saying, well, here we've got this uh, suburban area, which is some kind of a, a, a residential quiet area, we now have to think at the neighborhood level, for example, at that, as low down as that, about neighborhoods becoming working neighborhoods rather than dormitory areas. Uh, and this starts then to pose certain questions. Where and what are the new working spaces? Are they just at home? Is it just working in a spare bedroom? Do we start to take this seriously now? If it's going to become that important, where almost half the working population are in this kind of situation, potentially in this situation, we're going to have to take it seriously in, in, in the master planning uh, context. What are the new gathering spaces in the neighborhood likely to be? Do we just wait for another Starbucks or another Costa to turn up? Uh, or do we start to develop other kinds of third places, uh, which we don't have at the moment? Um, how are we going to start to combat stress, which the more we understand about self-employment and working in small units, there is a lot of stress. Um, it's a nice quote, everybody who works for himself has a tyrant for a boss, which is true. And you need to be able to relieve that, and neighborhoods are going to have to try and find a solution to that. So it's not about all this economic stuff being in the center of the city or on industrial estates or whatever. It's about it being round the corner in the neighborhood. And maybe now we're talking about mapping work styles rather than necessarily designing works places which we have done in the past, you know, a nice blot there. That's grey, that means factories. It's changing, it's changed radically. Um, the economic master plan as well pulls together what I would regard as the two big ideas of the last 20 years. Competitiveness, place competitiveness, the notion that places compete, still a relatively new notion. In the 90s that wasn't widespread, uh, but it's now commonplace, and indeed urban renaissance following them from uh, Richard Rogers' publication in 1999, that places need to function well, be vibrant, attractive, and even beautiful. Now let me give you an example of an economic master plan which was truly inspirational um, uh, and, and truly motivational, and it really was to me, uh, even though perhaps only 10% of it saw the light of day. It was done precisely 30 years ago in Glasgow in 1983. In fact, I was looking at the report as preparation for this talk, and it was May 1983 that this report was done. And it wasn't even called an economic, plan, economic master plan. How could it? I hadn't come up with the term then. Um, but it was commissioned by the Scottish Development Agency from Glasgow City Centre. The economic part of it was done as a favour, uh, uh, a freebie, if you like, um, a pro bono, as they called it in those days, from McKinsey, the great McKinsey, the great economic and business consultancy. And the physical stuff was done by the great Golden Cullen, a very impressive guy, who produced a city center townscape study. It would be a mistake to say it was a, it was a master plan. Um, but it was done in 1983, a watershed year for the city. Um, the Queen had just opened the Borough Gallery, big significant watershed there, um, and the city had just uh, started on its Glasgow's Miles Better campaign, which was launched. Within a year it would be bidding for the Garden Festival and winning for 1988, um, and a year after that bidding for the European City of Culture, which it got in 1990. Sorry, just a promotional there for the, for the great city of Glasgow. Um, and there you go. I'm going to give you just three little snapshots of Gordon Cullen's work. Cullen was brilliant. He got inside the skin and ambition of the city. You know, you're part of the thinking when he starts doing this kind of stuff. 
And that's Buchanan Street, the great European street with the, with the concert hall at the top, right down to the Clyde, straight down. Exciting. What do you mean a great European street? Well, it's all commonplace now, but this is 30 years ago, remember. Um, and this is beginning the excitement and the transformation. Um, we gave a presentation, or, uh, the SDA gave a presentation, and invited McKinsey along and Gordon Cullen. And, and Gordon Cullen, uh, sorry, and uh, um, everybody, this was largely to the businesses in Glasgow, and they were all terribly respectful for McKinsey and applauded very uh, uh, respectfully. But they roared approval for Cullen. Uh, the way he spoke, um, he really set it to music. This kind of stuff, it's not traditional master plan, but I mean, it, it says, come on and get a feel for this kind of stuff. Look at that. There's a drawing and there's another one of these block things. You're part of the thinking. He's taking you on a narrative here. He's leading you by the hand. Um, not everybody is a qualified planner and an architect. Reading master plans is difficult. I find them difficult. Um, so, in my view, then, to, get a, 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 to create a dynamic master plan process, you need three things in this. Um, you need to have a, an economic rationale, a reality check, uh, a believable anchoring. And this has been provided in this case by uh, McKinsey. Some exciting physical images and ideas uh, ones that we can all understand, ones that we can all believe in and look as though, yeah, that's in my terms of reference. And the third thing uh, that I think he does, which you totally miss now, is the thrilling prose uh, that he, I mean, he just writes fantastically. Uh, this, is, this is Cullen waxing eloquently in 1983, and I'll just pick up some quick ones here. This leads to a stereotype concept of a modern competitive city. It conceives of Glasgow as a competitive city, has aspirations in that way. Motorways, prestige office blocks, acres of car parking, a Disneyland conservation area in the middle of which is an air-conditioned supermarket and mall with acoustic wallpaper. Obviously, he's not terribly excited by that. Or is the city the generator of culture, a civilization, the living room of the region, a living room which is open to visitors, providing they observe normal good manners. He goes on, he goes on. Um, I don't want to overdo it, but he's, you know, the prose is really, really good and it, and it, and it, and it takes you on. Um, consequently, it seems to me, this is not connected, consequently it seems to me that since most of the competition for investment comes from other centres which have bitten the bit bait of progress, Glasgow could well try hard to become, quite simply, a real city. The image I am working to clarify is of Glasgow as an available, accessible and open city. Just as the pubs are open all day, I would like to translate this into different aspects of urban life. Join Glasgow now. It's rough, it rains a lot, it's not pretentious, and it's the flip side of Edinburgh. But it works, it tastes good, it's nourishing, and it turns you on. Wow. Of course it does. The business community in Glasgow got up and roared their approval of that. They love the images. Yeah, 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 yeah. McKinsey, as they are, got a nice round of applause. They were very good, very good. This guy set them alight. We want some of that. We want a dose of that. And, and the transformation of Glasgow, I think, uh, began, uh, begins with some of that. So, there's a bit of excitement for me. Um, my second point about making uh, more effective is that all master plans must include um, delivery. That should be part of the plan. How do we make this happen? Uh, I think there probably should be a master plan law passed that you shouldn't be allowed to write a master plan, or indeed strategy for that matter, um, unless you produce a section saying how on earth are we going to transfer this from stuff on paper to stuff in the street? How's it going to happen? What do we need to put in place? Um, we need to be much more obsessive about delivery in our culture than we are. In the British culture on the whole, things like strategy and policy making are regarded as higher order activities. 
things like delivery are not, they're, they're pretty, you know, well, well, you know, if we thought these bright, clever ideas, then a mere mug can deliver this. This is not true. Um, and we assign terms like policy wonk, in, the, in other words, that's saying, oh, this guy's got a big brain, or um, uh, a strategy guru. And then when you get to delivery, he says, well, the delivery bloke, you know, as though he's got a white van outside. Delivery is so important, and master plans have got to reflect that. And you very rarely see anything in master plans that, that, that take this one on board. This is one that's always concerned me, some of my pals that hopefully are out there uh, will have had um, animated discussions with me about this. I'm still really concerned about the engagement with the public. Um, now, you have to remember that I am way back an economist, uh, a social scientist, and all of us have done statistics and we've done sampling and we've done ways of framing and structuring samples so that you can get good information and accurate information. This is a scientific way that we try to do this when you're dealing with people and in social, in social science. Master plans seem to me to be a million miles away that, from that. We don't really do a, a structured sample uh, uh, and so on. As, and as I say there, you need to ensure that the whole system is represented in the room. Economic actors are often totally missing. And often, if you want to find out what the economic actors, the business guys, and women think. You have to go and speak to them one for one. They don't want to come into a, an arena with a bunch of people that are often are the only ones that are available to speak uh, because it's a wet Monday afternoon. Um, I've been, I'm too cynical there. Uh, so we need to have the whole system. We need to, I, it occurs to me that call centers have been around a while. It's not all that expensive. Why don't we have a call center involved in maybe doing a, uh, a, a course check on the attitudes of, of a community, could be easily done, answer these three questions, boom, 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 can be done, it's cheap enough. We could get a very good coverage rather than a, and start to satisfy me a bit more that this is a bit more scientific than a structured sample and so on, rather than the kind of often random ways that people tend to be uh, chosen to be involved in the, in the charrette or the master plan process. And there's a quote uh, from uh, a, a pal of mine. Um, he actually wrote that in, in an email to me, uh, so he should remain anonymous, but his name's Drew Mackey. And he says, most public officials see consultation as a distraction from their real job and leave it either up to inexperienced staff or hiring consultants to do it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a kind of cynical view about engagement with the public because I don't think they want to do it, really. And, and the drive to do it well is not sufficiently strong. And, I, and, and my hang-up is basically about this, the, the, the scientific nature of it, or the lack of scientific nature. So finally, to a case study that might have some interesting things. Don't worry, this is not a long case study. It's just a couple of slides. Um, that might have some interesting things to say to us in Britain about master planning and delivery when you don't own any of the land um, and you're really stuck for resources. And, and that, this case study, is in the Europeans' favorite city, Barcelona. How do you do master planning and do it when you want to transform an area but don't own any land and don't have any money? Well, then the name of the project is 22 at Barcelona. If you don't know it, Read it up. There's, there's plenty of good stuff on the, on, on the web. Um, it is known in the area uh, as, the, as, the, uh, as the Manchester of uh, Catalonia. Uh, it began about the year 2000. It sent, took an old area, uh, Poble Nou, old industrial area, and the aim of the whole uh, planning effort and drive was to create what, in their words, a new scientific, technological, and cultural platform. 200 hectares, pretty big site, 150 uh, city blocks. In other words, um, it's trying to create knowledge city uh, within Barcelona. And, and this summer I was there and I met the, the, the guy who was chief executive of this project 
Um, and uh, we had a discussion about where it was and so on. But the key, f that's what it looks like, just to give you some idea of the scale, both blue bits of the diagonal, and you can see the C at the bottom. So it's a big, and see how, how, uh, uh, how the grid pattern there works very strongly. City did five things. It set up a dedicated team. There's delivery, straight away, delivery. 22 at Barcelona. If you're serious about it, you set up a team. 18 people in it. Barcelona are obsessed about focused teams to deliver. They have five. They had five. That began with their experience of the Olympics, where they set up, obviously, a very big team. But they thought that the process of having a focused team to deliver was so important. Um, uh, 18 people initially, and there's about six or seven of that team were lawyers. So you get a feel for the way the master plan uh, is going. Um, second, you have a master plan. They wrote a master plan. It was prose. 90% of it was prose. There was no drawings in there. This was about aspirations, principles, and processes. Uh, what they call the new city model, which had aspirations for density, diversity, and flexibility. There were some predetermined plans that they did for parts of this area, but most of them were derived plans with, with owners. Um, it promoted, prioritized five sectors which is what their knowledge city is supposed to be based on, these kind of uh, prioritized areas. They put in an anf advanced infrastructure framework and said, well, they did have some money. I mean, you can't develop an area as, uh, as big as this without having no money for infrastructure. But relatively speaking, um, small amounts of money. Digital co connectivity um, was the key here. And here's the clever bit, I think. Um, that essentially, they took on the left-hand side their 100% industrial uses. They raised the density and said you, to potential developers, you can raise that to 2.7 on 70% of that site. We want 10% for housing, 10% for green space, and 10% for what we call knowledge-intensive businesses. Uh, which is those kinds of businesses that we've just been talking about, to make sure they're not all uh, a car showrooms or whatever. Um, so that was the way it tried to, to, to get hold of the land. The block owners, it would be up to them to jointly appoint architect and plan to prepare a scheme for them. About 141 plans in all have been done. 85 came from private owners. Um, much negotiation with the city, much to and fro uh, between the city and its team and its lawyers and its planners and uh, the individual owners of these blocks and so on. As a result, over 10 years, four, four and a half thousand new organizations employing 56,000 additional people. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't say that's a success, a terrific success? Um, it's helped transform the economy in that part of Barcelona it's innovative and a really interesting approach to the ma master planning and delivery processes in the city. I think has some strong lessons for Britain. Thank you very much.